Chinese cars are surging up the sales charts in Australia, primarily because they're cheap. But that doesn't mean they're nasty. Not all of them anyway. Indeed, one of the least nasty is the GWM Havel Jolion small SUV. But it's about to face its biggest challenge yet in the form of another Chinese high-tech newcomer, the Cherry Emoto 5, which will be the emperor of economy, the champion of cheap. Have your say in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and like, and let's get to it. SUVs like these two upstarts are getting plenty of attention from Aussie buyers because they're offered at prices that most Japanese brands just can't match anymore. The GWM Havel Jolion has been on sale in Australia since mid-2021 and is currently the third best-selling small SUV behind the dominant MG ZS, also from China, and the Mazda CX-30. The Cherry Motor 5 is the new kid on the block. It arrived here in early 2023 as part of the Chinese brand's Aussie relaunch. It's a global model based on a new platform and it's got plenty of tech, but it's also an unknown quantity, which is what makes this comparison so intriguing. We just don't know which way it's gonna go. At a glance, there's a lot of similarities between them. Both have generous equipment levels, plenty of tech, modern styling inside and out, plus 1.5 litre turbo petrol engines driving the front wheels via automatic transmissions. They also have great names. Forget H2, ASX, CHR, X1, Q2, or whatever random combination of alphanumerics. Jolion, a motor. These names have a bit of substance and appeal. Hopefully the rest of the cars do too. <laughs> you can get both of these Chinese chariots for under $30,000 in entry level guys, but we've got the big kahunas, the up-spec models dueling it out here. For similar money, you'll get the most basic Honda HRV, Subaru Crosstrek or Toyota Corolla Cross, or a mid-range Hyundai Kona or Kia Seltos. Both cars offer strong seven-year warranties, but the Cherry pulls ahead in after-sales support with slightly longer roadside assistance, seven years versus five. Both have cap price servicing, and while the service intervals are slightly longer with the GWM Havel when it comes to distance, the Cherry offers seven years of fixed price scheduled servicing and is slightly cheaper annually on average. Righto, the power factories. Both vehicles are pumping four-cylinder forced induction petrol engines but the Jolion has a fair bit more power than the Amoda. In fact, it's got more power than the standard Jolion as well, but that's not really saying much. Both of them also have automatic transmissions, a seven-speed dual clutch jobby in the Jolion, and a continuously variable automatic transmission in the Amoda with nine gear steps. The Amoda is claimed to be more fuel efficient, but we'll have our own data on that later in the video. Okie dokie, the Jolion interior, and this is nice. Maybe not as nice as it was two years ago when it launched, but perceived quality is pretty good. And it has a modern feel, a modern look and feel, but there's not that much soft touch. There's a little bit of here, some soft touch materials here, a little bit here. The rest is quite hard, unyielding, scratchy plastics. But look, if you're coming out of a 10 year old car, you're gonna be impressed with this SUV. It's, it's not too bad. The synthetic leather upholstery on the seats looks cheap, but feels good. It's nice and soft, and the cushioning is reasonably supportive. But look, the front seats are far from class leading in terms of overall comfort. Both front seats are heated, but only the driver's seat is power adjustable, and the steering can only be adjusted for height, not reach, like most rivals. The steering wheel itself feels nice, but the buttons are a little confusing at first glance. You also get a huge dual pane panoramic glass roof with a retractable blind, which makes the cabin feel bigger. The gear shifter is a rotary style jobby with a park button in the middle, and I'm in two minds about it because you can just spin it either way to your heart's content. There's no physical cue as to when you hit drive or reverse, and I'm not a big fan of that, especially when you're doing quick 
three-point turns, but it does liberate more space and storage is pretty good. You've got these pockets here, you can stick your phone in one of them, plus there's a large wireless phone charging pad there. You've got large and small concealed cup holders, nice. Pretty basic center bin, and this area under here is great for just putting odds and ends, plus you've got two USB A ports and a 12 volt socket. A 12.3 inch touchscreen perched on the center of the dash looks great and offers lots of car and safety system options, but little else. There's no GPS satellite navigation or digital radio, and ultimately it's best used with Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, which are wired only. But the phone mirroring systems look great, stretching the entire screen. There's also a row of shortcut controls underneath but if you want to adjust fan and temperature settings, you gotta do it via the touchscreen. The seven inch driver's display looks pretty good. It's got pretty sharp visual clarity and it has a suitably high tech theme and there's a reasonable amount of useful information going on. And I like the fact that there's three selectable themes so you can change the, uh, the design, which is nice, bit of customizability. But look, navigating through the actual system itself is an absolute pain in the butt. You've got to hold down OK for three seconds and then up and down and the back button cycle through left and right up and down. It's, it's a bit annoying, but I will say this, the head up display is very, very good, beaming lots of useful info directly onto the windscreen. The reversing camera is very good with a sharp picture and high res 360 degree bird's eye view popping up as soon as you slot it into reverse. So, the cherry, or cheery, as some people say, first impressions, well, it's a little bit like the exterior design. It's more modern, it's sportier, and it's a little bit fancier than the Jolly On. You've got this nice touches of gloss black, just a little bit, and they're fancier, as are these more contoured seats. But again, like the Jolly On below the belt line, the plastic's crummy. The Cherry's sportier seats have similarly supple synthetic leather trim, but the form-fitting chairs hug the body a little better and deliver slightly better support despite the much softer cushioning. As in its rival, both front seats are heated, but the Emoda adds a power-adjustable passenger seat along with a six-way powered driver's seat. Furthermore, the steering wheel can be adjusted for both height and reach, mercy be. The steering wheel rim itself is a bit thicker and has a sporty flat bottom and the buttons are a bit easier to understand at first sight. It gets a sunroof, but it's half the size of the Jollyons, and together with the dark interior decor and its slightly narrower body, it feels a little bit tighter in here. I like the cabin decor in this one better. It's more modern, a little bit more sophisticated, like these plastics around here are just a little bit smoother, a bit high quality. The gear shifter too, it's got a premium feel and it's more intuitive than that rotary dial in the Jolly On. But like its Chinese competitor over there, the USB ports are in the same position. They're hard to reach for the driver and that's because of its Chinese origins left-hand drive. And look, execution is not great either. Check out this, that center bin is supposed to open all the way up, but it doesn't because it gets caught on the side of the seat. So I'm not sure how that got past quality assurance. Apart from that, um, storage is pretty good, probably slightly better than the Jolly On. You've got a wireless phone charge pad on this side. That side is not a wireless phone charger, but it's nice. Um, big storage area under here. You've got the twin cup holders and the center bin that doesn't open properly is much bigger. And there's even an air conditioning vent in there to keep your drinks cool. In terms of tech, the Cherry has a smaller 10.25 inch central touchscreen and like its rival, also misses out on GPS sat nav. But the operating system is much easier to use. It looks better, in fact, it looks kinda like Apple CarPlay, and also features surprisingly snappy voice controls. Hello, car. I'm listening. I'm cold. Okay, warming up. The infotainment system also has more depth and features, and of course, Apple CarPlay, which is wireless in this one but Android Auto is wide only still. It doesn't have digital radio, but it does have a physical volume dial, which is a big plus in my book. Touch sensitive buttons below the screen look pretty cool, but the lack of haptic feedback means old people won't like it. That said, 
at least this has fan speed and climate control temperature adjustment, which gives it a leg up on the Jolion. But the controls can be hard to see if it's a sunny day, reflections and all that. The digital instrument cluster is bigger in this one. It's 10.25 inches versus seven inches, and it looks a bit better too. It's got a similar level of uh, drive data to the other vehicle, but accessing it and using the menus is much easier thanks to the more intuitive steering wheel controls. Um, it's got three uh, themes or graphical modes for a bit of customization like the other vehicle, but one of these is better because it's got your conventional speedo on one side and taco on the other. And personally, I like having the rev counter. I know what the petrol engine is doing. Um, overall, I think the Cherry is pulling ahead slightly in terms of ease of use and overall cabin equipment, but there is one big omission and that is a head up display. It does not have one. The reversing camera is pretty similar in terms of visual clarity and function and has the same 360 degree bird's eye view that pops up when you slot it into reverse gear. You get front and rear parking sensors plus similar amount of regular camera angles and a slightly better 3D mode because you can drag with your finger and spin it around. Plus the car is also transparent, which is pretty handy. Both city SUVs have impressive tech levels reasonable driver displays and infotainment systems. And while the Emoto misses out on a head-up display, it has a better user experience overall, both digitally and physically, and a better eight-speaker Sony sound system compared to the Jolion's tinny no-name six-speaker setup. Both cars have recent five-star ANCAP safety ratings, which means they should offer the best possible protection in the event of a crash. They've also got plenty of semi-autonomous driving aids designed to avoid getting into trouble in the first place. Both come with seven airbags as well, covering the front and rear seats, including a central front airbag. The Jolion is just over seven centimeters longer than the Emoto, and so it should offer better leg room. And right here, I've got heaps. Put my feet under the seats, heaps of knee room. The knees aren't too raised, and uh, headroom's not too bad either. There's these little scallops in the ceiling. So even though it's got the big sunroof, it's not too bad up there. Comfort and convenience. The, uh, the bench is a bit flat and fairly firm. There's a bit more contouring on my back there. You've got twin USB A ports, twin vents, a fold out armrest with cup holders, plus twin isofix and triple top tether points for the baby seats. It's definitely more cramped back here. I don't have as much knee room. My feet only just go under the seats. And headroom is actually not too bad considering it's got that sloping rear roof line. But yeah, these one piece sports seats definitely make things feel a bit more enclosed in here. Shoulder room's a little bit tighter. In terms of comfort and convenience, it's got quite a flat bench. And the cushions are much firmer than the soft front seats, which is kind of interesting. Um, you've got the fold down armrest with cup holders, twin air vents, uh, two ISO fix points, triple top tethers. So amenity is almost identical to the Jolion, except for you only get one USB port, not two. Only the Cherry has a power operated boot, which is really very handy, but the Jolion has more boot space, more real estate on paper. And we've measured it, and in reality, yes, it's got more boot space as well. It's also got more amenity. Two bag hooks versus, well, none. Only the Jolion has an LED light in the boot. Both have space saver spare wheels, cargo covers, and 60-40 split folding rear seats to open up a bit more space. Well, apart from being a bit smaller overall, the Cherry is narrowly inching ahead but a lot can change on the road. Cue the driving music. First impressions from the Jolion, well, it's a little bit unsophisticated in most measures. The way it turns, the way it goes, the way it stops. And the expectation from the cabin design and the equipment levels is not fulfilled in the driving experience. It kind of just feels a bit unfinished and there's a lot of unrealized potential here for sure. The engine has a bit of spark, it's got punch, but you just have to wait a while to get at it because of the laggy response when you hit the throttle. It's as if the car is one or two seconds behind what your foot is actually requesting. Around town, it's predictable 
straightforward to drive and easy to operate at urban speeds. But out on the open road, it's less convincing. It feels a little bit out of sorts and a bit uncoordinated. That's not helped by its firm suspension setup, which unsettles the car on anything other than smooth road surfaces. This compromises ride quality and you tend to feel bumps and lumps at slower speeds as well. When you're plodding along, the powertrain is fairly quiet, but give it some gas and it gets a little bit unrefined and more intrusive. And there's also a little bit of tire noise and wind noise as well. Sight lines out of the Havel are pretty good. The vehicle's raised ride height and big windows delivering acceptable outward vision. All right, I'm in the Cherry and right away, it's very noticeable that this is a softer and smoother vehicle in a number of ways. The steering is much lighter, the ride comfort more compliant, and the powertrain isn't as laggy. I also like the fact that the indicator is actually on the right hand side, not the left, although it does make a very funny bing bong noise. It doesn't have the absolute punch of the Jolion, but at least it's there and ready to go. Initial throttle response is much sharper, although power does seem to taper off a bit quicker. Conversely, the brake pedal is quite doughy. You have to sink the boot in quite a bit before the brakes work well, where the Havel is more responsive to deceleration. At urban speeds, this small SUV ain't too bad. It's able to navigate around town easily, and its small size makes it feel quite nimble. But at higher speeds and on the open road, it really starts to lose its composure. That suspension is just too soft and floppy and body control is woeful. It leans so hard through the corners and it's just really unpredictable and ponderous and I don't like pushing it through corners. Sure, not many drivers will, but the fact that it's so dynamically inept is kind of scary. Ride comfort compares favourably to the Havel, and while its softer suspension is a curse on the open road and through corners, it glides over all but the deepest and nastiest of potholes very, very serenely. It's a more refined vehicle and, in general, more pleasant to drive than its rival, assuming you turn all the electric nannies off. I'll get to that in a jiffy. But yeah, the engine isn't quite as loud, there's less tyre noise, Although I reckon wind noise is a little bit more prevalent around the mirrors, but overall the cabin is a little bit quieter in this one. Visibility isn't as good partly due to the sporty rear end design and larger rear pillars, which create bigger blind spots. And I don't like the curved fish eye interior mirror either. It makes everything seem a whole lot closer and you almost feel like people are tailgating you when they're really not. When it comes to driver assistance systems, the Cherry really struggles. It's often best to turn most of them off because they're either unreliable or overly intrusive. For instance, the emergency lane keep assist system will detect a lane and then at the last minute, jut the steering wheel really sharply and it can be a little scary. On paper, the Cherry should be significantly more efficient, but our testing showed they used almost the same amount of fuel on the same varied drive loop, but both used more than claimed. In terms of driving dynamics and motivation, these cars remind us of where the Koreans were 20 years ago. So much potential, but they need a lot more finessing, both in terms of chassis dynamics and driver assistance system functionality. Build quality is a bit iffy here and there as well, both exhibiting creaks and squeaks in the cockpit. But which is better to drive? It's a very close call, but the Havel edges ahead because it isn't as floppy and limp in corners and I'd rather put up with firmer ride quality than sketchy dynamics. But that's just me. There's plenty of work to be done on these two SUVs before they're competitive across all measurable metrics. But in terms of purchase price, interior space, and equipment levels, they punch well above their weight. And ultimately, their lack of dynamic polish won't matter to a majority of buyers. Indeed, Chinese SUVs like these are now the logical choice for so many new car buyers. So, which one wins? It's such a close call. Probably the closest comparison I can remember. Both vehicles are frustratingly unfinished. They could be so much better with just a bit of fine tuning. The Jolion, 
loads of interior space, good equipment, but at the end of the day, the Cherry wins. It's got slightly better equipment levels and is just that little bit easier to live with. Thanks for watching. Hope you liked the video as much as we sort of liked driving the cars. And uh, don't forget to like the vid, subscribe, and leave a comment. So uh, yeah, catch you later. Ciao.